Great. So my name is Catherine Silliman. I'm a research scientist at the NOAA Atlantic uh, Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory in Miami, Florida, in the United States. And I also work with the Northern Gulf Institute. And uh, our omics program uh, at the AOML lab um, uses eDNA to understand biodiversity, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico and the South Atlantic. But we also are collecting um, and helping collect samples from research cruises across the world. Um, and uh, just to acknowledge some of the funding before I move on, the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program, the NOAA Omics Program, um, and the Northern Gulf Institute. And so there's already been a lot of talks today about a little bit about how eDNA uh, is collected, how it's structured, so I'm not going to go too much into that, um, except that you know, we're taking samples, often our case, seawater um, or seawater sediments, um, and trying to understand uh, the range of biodiversity found within that sample. Um, depending on what marker you choose or gene region, you can uh, target different kinds of taxa. Um, and so what we use a lot is the 16S RNA, our RNA gene, which will get you some bacteria and archaea. Um, and the 18S gene, which can tell you a little bit about the protist and metazoa in a sample. Um, we uh, use large um, sequencing data to arrive at amplicon sequence variants, or ASVs. And so these are all of the unique sequences seen within a sample. Um, and then we use uh, public databases to assign taxonomy to these ASVs. So these are databases that have sequences in them that people have assigned some sort of taxonomic information to. Um, and so managing eDNA data is complex in part because there's many steps to arrive at the um, eDNA occurrences. And so you have the context of the environment that the samples were taken. Uh, you have all of the information about how those samples were prepared. Um, there's many different ways to process eDNA data to arrive at that taxonomic um, assignment. And then you have the actual um, observations themselves. Um, there's been mentioned today about some existing standards that help um, with recording all of this kind of data and metadata. So one commonly used community standard is the uh, minimum information about a marker gene sequence or MIMARCs, also minimum information about any sequence, MIX-S. Um, and then you know, Darwin Core has uh, the DNA-derived data extension, um, which pulls from these other terms. Um, and you can also use Darwin Core occurrence to talk about the actual um, sample and occurrence uh, context itself. So the uh, and so in addition to the challenge of just organizing all of that information so you really know the provenance of how you got to your um, eDNA occurrence, uh, there's a lot of different places you're expected to put your data uh, along the pipeline, and we've heard about that a little bit today. Um, and so in the United States, our raw sequences are deposited in NCBI. Um, what we'd like to do is then also um, put those ASVs and those occurrences on OBIS, on GBIF, um, but then we also have all of the environmental observations, some of those which you can put on OBIS and GBIF, um, but we also have you know, requirements in the United States of where they'd like us to put environmental data. Then you have all of the code protocols for how we arrived at these assignments. Um, you know, where is a good place to put all of those scripts? Um, so this is a concept map uh, curi um, courtesy of Matt Biddle at um, the National Centers for Environmental Information of what we'd like to do. Um, but even this is a lot to ask for any um, standard researcher. Um, so what our group is trying to do is, is start to make um, templates and workflows that can make it easier just for us because we have many thousands of samples that we're trying to um, make publicly available, but ideally make it something that can be applied across NOAA with a lot of the omics work that we're doing um, and maybe be useful in format um, to other folks as well. And so we're calling this the Study Data Management Strategy, the SDMS. Um, and, and the initial uh, internal management is really just a Google Sheets template um, that is built off of the MIMARCS standard. Um, and so the goal is to help you organize your data internally in a way that's, that's um, user-friendly, but also makes it really easy to submit the data that you need to submit to NCBI 
because at the bare minimum, um, that's something that, that we're going to do and, and that the folks we work with are going to do. So each sheet in this Google sheet has a different type of uh, metadata or sample data. So you might have data about the study as a whole, um, you know, the funding agency, the, the name of the project. Um, then the next sheet would be your sample data. So this is the context about how the environmental sample was collected, you know, sample name. Um, for Darwin Core folks, you know, this is your event information. Then we have our prep data. So this is what you did to the sample in order to get those eDNA sequences. Um, and one sample can be prepared different ways. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to help link uh, the sample information to then your different, often they're called sequencing libraries, um, but those different molecular markers that you might be using for one sample. Um, then you have analysis data. And so this is the software you use, the version you use, the parameters you used, the reference database, um, you know, everything you did to arrive at your downstream analyses and links out to um, like a DOI uh, GitHub repository with code that's not uh, captured with existing standards. Um, and then uh, we, we make it easy for you to then sort of upload these sheets straight onto NCBI. Um, but to then get them onto OBIS, um, it requires a lot of mapping between the terms that NCBI is looking for and the um, Darwin core terms that OBIS requires. Um, and so uh, I have developed um, a code a workflow um, that uh, is linked to right there um, that you know, I'm calling eDNA to OBIS. So really, really clever, but is sort of helping map between um, our metadata uh, template to get you to your occurrence, your DNA derived data, um, eventually an extended measurement or fact, and then using the uh, IPT to um, get your metadata XML. Um, and so, uh, um, so yeah, I, I explained the workflow a little bit just then. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna uh, hop forward to talk about some of the challenges um, that went through with this use case. And so we have uh, a cruise that went out in 2021 in the Gulf of Mexico. This had uh, 484 samples um, across 54 sites. These are sam water samples taken from a Niskin bottle and then split up into three replicate water samples and uh, that were filtered on these Sterevex filters. And then each uh, water sample we did 16S or 18S sequencing on. Um, and, and this data is publicly available on GBIF and OBIS. Huge shout out to Steve Fromel um, with GBIF and OBIS USA for, for helping get that through. Um, and so ideally, it'd be great to really record the event hierarchy between the Niskin well grab, um, our replicate water samples that are each extracted separately for DNA, and then the different treatments uh, that we did in the lab, um, whether it be 16S or 18S. Um, the current uh, um, currently, GBIF does not allow you to link the DNA-derived extension um, with an event core, um, and so we can't really have the hierarchy the way that it would be, uh, in my mind, most helpful to have, and that is used for other biodiversity uh, observation hierarchies, but it sounds like the new data model will be helping fix that. So right now, we instead record that information in a different field. Um, another a uh, big challenge is that OBIS uh, requires you to have your taxonomy uh, matching to worms, which is the World Register of Marine Species. Um, worms uh, is great for many things, um, but it does not have a lot of uh, microbial taxa in it. Um, and especially for 18S and 16S, that's what we're, that's what we're getting. Um, and so, uh, you know, I have some code that helps you get the best match you can in worms for an assigned taxonomy. But a lot of times that means that you're going to have to assign it to a much higher taxonomic rank than you actually um, had from your, I see some head nodding, someone knows the problem, that you actually had from um, your assignment. Uh, and also the term eukaryota is not in worms, um, but is, is commonly um, applied with these uh, public data sets. And so, you know, how do we handle that? Um, and so this is just highlighting in blue are the uh, taxonomic levels that uh, were assigned with um, our, our pipeline. And then orange is uh, what percent of our um, taxonomic assignments were able to be mapped to worms. 
Um, and so you can see at the uh, genus or species level, a lot of our um, sequences were just not able to find a good match on worms. Um, and that does get better, um, but it's definitely uh, something that, that requires um, some working with worms to figure out. Um, so there are some recommendations for how you can show your, um, yes, for how you can show uh, that taxonomic information that was assigned, but um, you know, figuring out really the best way to capture the whole taxonomic string um, is not fully explained in the existing um, documentation. So that's something that I've been working on a little bit and I'd be definitely happy to talk about more afterwards. Um, and then there's just challenges matching between MIMARCs and Darwin Core. Um, you know, uh, MIMARCs only has one term for depth. Darwin Core wants you to have two, the minimum and the maximum. So it's not always a one-to-one -one in terms of how you convert these things and, and how do we make that easy. Um, and then with that, since I think I'm short on time, uh, next steps is to better include environmental measurements using the extended measurements or fact file. Currently, it's a Jupyter notebook, but I'd like to transfer that to make it a more automated uh, snake make pipeline, um, and then also turn it into a reproducible uh, Docker container so folks will be able to run it um, easily on, on uh, if they just have Docker installed. Um, with that, I'd like to acknowledge Luke Thompson, whose lab I work at, at NOAA AOML, Sean Anderson, who did the collection, um, and uh, my funding. So I saw that you skipped over the control question I did. because you were worried about time, but yeah. I feel like, can you go into that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, very common with eDNA uh, projects is that we take control samples. So this is blank water you're putting through the filter. This is blank water you're putting into a reaction in the lab. Um, and those can be really helpful for telling apart contamination, um, but they don't really fit on GBIF or OBIS. Um, and so, you know, what is a good recommendation for how to report those control samples? Um, you know, the raw sequences are available on NCBI, but there's not really a good place to point someone there um, or to point them to the ASVs that you um, got from those controls. So I think that that's definitely an area of discussion um, that could be helpful, because right now I just have event remarks. Here are the controls used. Hopefully you'll find them, you know, one day. Um, yeah, thanks, Steve, for pointing that out. So I, if, if folks have other thoughts about the best way to report that, handle that, um, yeah, I, I'd love to hear it. Two questions and then. Uh, it's a nice presentation. So we are also working on publishing marine data set to OBS and ZVIF. So uh, my question is like, as you mentioned that like we, have the, we can't link the DNA derived extension to the event core, so we have to link it only with the occurrence core. So how you deal with the measurement uh, data, the EMOF extension when you use it? So do you link like, uh, for example, we have a sample, and then for one sample, we collect uh, lots of other information like abiotic information, like temperature, salinity. So these are linked in the event level, but when we add the measurement data at the occurrence level, we have to add all those measurement, event level measurements into the occurrence level. So how do you deal with it? Yeah, um, so yeah, we, uh, this is something Steve and I um, have been working on a little bit, but we have not actually put an extended measurement or fact up yet. The plan is to have a very, very large file where each occurrence ID, so you know, that's 300,000 occurrence IDs just for this project would have all of the measurements for the event, um, which is certainly not ideal, but it would be, currently the only way that you'd be able to have that information. So yeah, that's the problem that we have, <laughs> we are currently facing. So what we have done is like, we are not uh, publishing the measurement data at the occurrence level, we are still publishing it in a event level, but through the other web services. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think, I think um, in the short term, like we and will have a link to NCEI where that information is also hosted. Um, and maybe the GVF new model will resolve this issue. Yes, yeah, for. that's that's what they keep saying, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I would like to throw 
to provocations for the lunch discussions, if you compare what is going on in this session to other sessions at Tadwick, taxonomic sessions and, and annotation sessions, you will notice the difference that in the eDNA and metabarcoding context, publisher provided name, more often than not, will be a historical illustration of what it was at the moment of publication. And your annotations, your latest name interpretation will be the name to use. And I think that is a, a difference and people working with the nomenclatural systems locally or internationally should take this into account. And the, and the, other, uh, and the other similar aspect of, of, uh, of this is that um, provisional names may be even actually more common than the accepted names when you handle eDNA and metabarcoding data. So they cannot be treated as second or third class or we do it in three year, like th th uh, in three years uh, or five years perspective, simply because there is no formalized name under the code. Uh, because I think your own country or your own community will be pressing you hard to handle them first, maybe even ahead the formal Latin names. Uh, and thank you very much for the very uh, inspiring talk. Lots of, uh, lots of great ideas there. Thanks. Yeah, just a quick question before I even forget it. <laughs> Don't you think that, you know, because you highlighted a lot of challenges with matching, you know, between taxonomy and different um, resources that you used, like silver worms and others. Can we have, like, are we, do you believe that we're in a stage where we can actually have official taxonomy and solve this problem where we will have, you know, standard ranks and avoid having those multiple databases. Are we ready, like technically and mentally, to have official taxonomy? Because we do have now, you know, this genetic fingerprint, which is, you know, the best way to resolve the relationship and perhaps having the committee, like International Committee of uh, Viral Nomenclature, for example, taxonomy. So they effectively have an official taxonomy because all the names that are approved going through the committee um, of this viral nomenclature, but all taxonomic proposals for anything in a viral classification is going through this body where there, there is, if it's approved, it's getting to the list of names, you know, that exist in the viral taxonomy. It's, I think that concepts should, you know, perhaps be applied also in, in other taxonomies. Even so, it's a science, but perhaps we're in a state where we, uh, you know, we could actually say we agree on something there. You know, we agree on the relationship and we have perhaps, you know, like UniUK initiative, for example, you know, where they will, where the, the suggestion is that, you know, people who um, describe new protest, they can apply the taxonomic proposal directly on the phylogenetic tree. And this is reviewed by the community and then get accepted or rejected. So perhaps the way to deal with all of these challenges is something, you know, something similar. I don't know. I'm just thinking, you know, that having one language will really help in that space. Yes. Yes. To all of that. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a taxonomist. Um, I, I'm not even a microbial ecologist, but I, I think much more crosstalk between the reference databases that people are using um, between NCBI and the other um, like large international sequence databases who they get the sequences first. And a lot of people make their databases directly from them. And then NCBI says, we're not a taxonomic authority. Don't trust our taxonomy. But that is where people get their taxonomy. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think yeah, more crosstalk would make a lot of this much easier. Um, but I think there's also room for just sequence diversity. Um, so I don't, yeah, maybe not focusing as, as much on the taxonomy, um, but just, you know, being able to search. Yes. Yeah. No, that would be, that would be really great. Yeah. We need more standards. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good presentation. So uh, the next one is a recorded presentation online by uh, Rachel on uh, marine megafauna. I think it's, it's close to being